I'm recording it. Let's go. Okay, cool. Very good. Hey, hi everyone. My name is Joe Reinke. I've been involved in Lake Harriet for, I don't know, five or six or seven years now. Um, I started out as a TCSC person. I didn't have really any sailing experience when I started. Um, just some, I don't know, like Boy Scout camp memories from when I was 12 years old that really stuck with me. And then I, uh, I'm not, I didn't grow up in Minneapolis and I moved to the city for work and was looking for ways to meet people and always wanted to be a sailor. So I found TCSC and that really kind of got me in. So um, I'm definitely kind of a, a poster child TCSC member. Um, fell in love with racing maybe three or four years ago and bought a boat. I think this will be my third or fourth season with my boat. Started traveling to regattas like nationals and whatever and really have just kind of... Um, you know, fallen in love with the culture of it. You all are a great group of people. It's good social, it's good competition. Um, so yeah, that's me. My topic is boat speed fundamentals in the MC. It's, the slides are going to be pretty simple. I mean, these are simple concepts, but um, really I think key to success in our class is being able to make the boat go, you know, at, at the optimal speed in any given condition and in a lot of ways until you achieve that base boat speed in any condition it's very difficult to participate fully um, in a race so maybe ryan if you want to introduce yourself now and share a bit about the topic you plan to talk about yep uh so my name's uh ryan and i've been sailing since around age six um and yeah, I've done a bunch of scow racing, uh, X-boat racing, opti racing, uh, and then college racing too. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, starts today. Very good. So um, Cynthia, is there anything else you'd like to add before I jump into some of our content? No, let's get started. Okay, very good. Let me share my screen. Cool, can everyone see? Yes. Yes. All right. Very good. So that's the date. We're fun to sail fast. Here's a picture of some racing on the carrier. Uh, it's light wind. I hope to see a lot more wind than this, but um, I got to say about light wind, um, specifically for, for um, some of the TCS folks on the call. I used to absolutely hate light wind when I <clears throat> was first starting racing. And that's because all of your mistakes are just magnified. And it can be so much more difficult to get your boat up to speed and maintain speed. Um, I must say, though, as my skills have progressed, I, I think the light wind races that we do on Harriet are some of the most enjoyable sailing experiences. No one else races in the conditions we do because we're a flat water lake. Uh, I mean, you know, if we have a confident PRO, steady three to five, sure, let's do it. That doesn't happen anywhere else. I mean, it has to be at least five, if not five to seven for a lot of lakes to sail. So something unique about Lake Harriet. And, uh, you know, hopefully if anyone on the call has a uh, distaste for light wind, I can convince you either now or in the future that it's quite a bit of fun. Okay, fast sailing fundamentals. Right. Um, the MC is, is a pretty simple boat, and that's really what makes it such a great boat to, to learn sailboat racing, in, in my opinion. Um, these four things I have listed here, the way I like to think of them for the purpose of this presentation and kind of in general, boat heel is my kind of metric. It's, uh, it's something that I'm considering for feedback all the time. And then my rudder and my main sheet and my body placement are my three primary 
um, ways of controlling or maintaining the heel of the boat. Um, I think using boat heel as a primary metric works, at least for me, because uh, it's the most comprehensive indicator of whether the whether or not the boat's up to speed in a lot of ways. Uh, this photo is Bill Dreheim. He's a guy from Texas who's won several national events. Really nice guy. He has a, a sail making company too and puts out a lot of um, educational content. So there's a website called Salesing, which I'm sure some of you are aware of that uh, is really quite good as far as um, providing content, uh, content for scout racing in general. And a lot of his content is on there too. Uh, one thing you might notice that's missing here is I don't have any mention of any of the kind of secondary sail controls. They're important, like the Vang and the Cunningham and the Traveler and the Outhaul. Um, but I, I think when you're thinking about how do I make my MC move as fast as Ryan Grosh or whoever else, it can be pretty overwhelming. Um, so I'd like to really narrow the focus for the purpose of this conversation to really these three main controls, the rudder, the main sheet, and where you put your body, which I think is pretty intuitive because as you're sitting there in the boat, I mean, you have the tiller in one hand, the sheet in the other hand, and you're either hiked out or in or on the low side and um, everything else can seem like a distraction. I think it's okay to consider them a distraction a little bit as once when you're getting started and just focus on these things. Um, yeah, so I want to pause maybe, maybe first at the top here before we uh, dig into this. Uh, what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation is just talk a little bit more first about boat heel in general, what optimal is and, and some other factors such as hull steering. Uh, then I'll talk about the best ways to use the rudder and the main sheet and how to use your body, but and how it all comes together to um, to focus on boat speed. Here's, but here's Joe talking. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, before I do that, uh, maybe at this top slide, Ryan, do you have any thoughts to add? Uh. Nope, I think you're doing great. Okay, how about anyone else? Um, I don't know, I think I saw Darren on the call, some other experienced folks, Jamie Frazier, John Getzinger. You can say no, that's okay. <laughs> I, I like what you said that, you know, boat heel is sort of, uh, I don't recall the word you used, a, a metric though, sort of. And all those other controls, uh, I'm thinking, uh, uh, particularly Vang and Traveler, you know, it, it's about, you use those to support these metrics, right? You, you do, you need to put on Vang, you need to reduce Traveler so that you can keep boat heel at a decent, at a decent place. Like it's, it, if you think of it to support these things, I really like that way of yeah. those other controls. Yeah, that's exactly it. I think that's a good summary. Um, I, find it, I find it much easier just to think of boat heel as my primary consideration and everything else I'm doing is kind of supporting that when it comes to speed. Yeah. So what is boat heel? Uh, I'm sure most of us know this term, but so I can define it. Define it. The, the heel of the boat is, is how the boat kind of is, uh, it's the line of the boat through the water. In simple terms, it's the boat tips up when I pull the sail in, and when I let the sail out, it goes flat. Um, that's what we mean by boat heel, is the angle of the hull as it goes through the water. Um, our, boards, our boats are leeboard boats, as we well know. We have two sideboards. Um, they're angled out, as you can see in this picture to the top right where it says too cold, you can see that the board is kind of angled out away from, um, away from kind of the, the line perpendicular to the bottom of the hull. And for that reason, that really is why we need to have the boat tipped up on the side a bit for optimal efficiency. It's because you want that board to be like vertical into the water for 
straight line, efficient sailing. Um, so it's about 15 to 20 degrees. Uh, I did mention this, it really is the number one factor for speed. The boat is designed to be sailed at this angle. If you're sailing it flat or you're sailing it too high, um, there are reasons that you want to do that, which I'll get into in a moment. But for straight line speed, if you're not at this 15 to 20 degree angle, you're not really sailing the boat as it was designed, which, which is okay. But for racing, we need to go as fast as we can in any given set of conditions. So it's really quite important. So Joe, I love the uh, diagram that you have up there with the too cold, too hot, just right, because it shows the blue line for the water and you can see where just right, the edge of the, um, the boat is right at the water. It's not under the water and it's not above the water. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think I think I've been doing this enough that I just kind of have like a feeling of what's flat and what's high and what's just right. But um, as I was training myself to to understand that feeling intuitively, that was an important uh, visual indicator of what just right feels like. You want the water rushing past your boat just below the gunnel, not coming up over the edge, but just below. Yeah. Um, I said it's all about the board. I think we can get into some, some technicalities here, which I won't talk about too much. Uh, but just for the geeks on the call, your sail is generating aerodynamic lift that off the, the leeward side of the sail that is kind of pulling the boat to the side and there's a, a healing force which makes the boat want to tip over. You use your body to counter your body weight, which we'll talk about shortly, to counteract that healing force to keep the boat balanced. And that allows the force to be uh, efficiently transitioned actually to the board in the water, which serves as a wing, just like the sail. And that board generates hydrodynamic lift to windward. And that's that design is what helps our boats point into the wind really quite well. Um, so if that board is at an angle, either out or in, it's just much less efficient at generating that hydrodynamic lift. Hmm. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to boat heel, um, a little bit more nuanced, but but really important nonetheless. You'll hear the term hull steering. And really that's just the tendency of our boats based on the shape of the hull is when, when it's tipped up quite high, you'll notice that the boat rounds up into the wind uh, and perhaps a little bit less noticeable, but when it's flat uh, or tipped lower, the boat will turn down. Um, this is probably most noticeable when you get hit with a big puff on the lake and the boat heals up really hard and wants to round up into the wind and you have to drop air out of your main or, or hike quite hard to keep it from doing that. Um, but you can also notice it if you're the other way, if you are sailing along, let's say at eight miles an hour, nicely hiked out and you don't change anything else except you really throw your body back and hike hard, uh, you'll feel the boat want to turn down a bit so you can use that also to your advantage. Um, one, one important application of this that I find is when we're going through attack, you want to, you, and we'll talk about rudder usage here in a moment, but um, I really wanna keep my rudder as, as neutral as possible. So I do everything I can to encourage the boat to smoothly round up into the wind so that I can just kind of nudge the tiller a bit to get through the eye of the wind onto the other tack. And you can do that by using hull steering, sheet in a little bit harder than you might so that the boat becomes a little bit more powered up 
heels up, rounds into the wind, perhaps move your body weight closer into the center of the boat for the same reason, so that the boat heels up a little bit higher, which through these hull steering principles, turns the boat up into the wind and starts the tacking process. Um, I'm sure some of you uh, know this term, maybe a question for those that are a bit less experienced. Have you ever heard this term hull steering? Is it confusing? And does my, um, does my commentary here clear things up or does anyone have any questions? I'd have to say, um, as someone who has experience on a boat that is not a scow that's meant to sail at 15 to 20 degrees, it makes a lot more sense on a boat that is flat, that is sailed flat. <laughs> you can really feel it then. I think that's a key point, Justin. You're right. And um, for those of you who have any experience in college sailing uh, on 420s, this is a very important and uh, widely used principle. Uh, and actually, this diagram on the right here is is a centerboard boat. Uh, so if you, it's a little bit detailed, but if you read through here, it will um, highlight the point that you just mentioned, Justin. So yeah, it is much more noticeable on a centerboard boat versus a leeboard boat like a scow. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the rudder. Uh, the rudder is a very powerful tool. Um, it, you can turn very sharply on an MC. The MC is a very maneuverable boat. You can see just how big the rudder is in comparison to the boat down here. Um, just for, for information, uh, some of you may know what an e-scow looks like. An e-scow has dual rudders, but the rudders are only about this big. They're like the size of a shoebox or a little bit bigger. And our little MC scout rudders are almost double the size, um, which makes our boats incredibly maneuverable. You can really turn on a dime in an MC. Um, one thing to remember though, is because there's so much surface area on that rudder, if you turn it hard to the side, it's like slamming on the rear brakes on your bike. I mean, you really slow down quite a bit. Uh, so, Yes, we need to turn hard sometimes to avoid a collision to, uh, you know, I don't know, for some other tactical reason, but really smooth and neutral is the goal whenever possible, especially when sailing straight and you're trying to sail fast. You don't want to have to feel a lot of pressure on the rudder. And if you have everything else balanced correctly, which we'll talk about here in a moment with the main sheet and your body placement and the other sail controls, in most circumstances, now if it's very heavy, maybe that's different, but in most circumstances, it is possible to neutralize the weather helm. And that really should be the goal. Hey, this is, this is Ryan here. Yeah, I will say you wanna to try to neutralize the helm as, as much as possible, but you do want like a, a slight amount of helm. Um, but uh, because a lot of times when you're healed up, you're going to have a little helm, you're always kind of working to neutralize it a little bit. But uh, if it is completely neutral, then that's actually uh, not good um, because then you might be like fall off the wind a little bit and not be pointing as high as you can be. So I always like to have just like a slight amount of helm um, but usually a lot of times you have too much. So you got to think about that. Yeah, maybe to expand on that a little bit, Ryan, um, I think what I heard you say is if the neutral, if the helm is completely neutral, you might be, so you're sailing close hauled, but you might not really be edging up closer to the wind as much as you could be, or perhaps your boat isn't quite as powered up as it could be, your sails out or, or something like this. Uh, is, that, is that kind of what you mean? Yep, yeah, you might not be uh, like pointing as high as you could be. Um, say if you get like a, a lift 
and you're sailing straight with a neutral neutral helm, you might not be able to sense that you can actually point higher and that you actually got the lift. Hmm. Okay. No, that makes sense. So, so we want the boat to be pulling a little bit into the wind because that allows us to know that we're sailing as close to the wind as possible, I think, in simple terms. Yep. But yeah, it's, it's a very, very slight amount. So neutral, but on the side of a little bit more helm. Okay. And that's that pulling force that pulls your boat into the wind when you're sailing upwind. And you can feel that helm by the pull on your rudder. Right. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of us have, have experienced that. And I think the comment you made earlier is, is important too, that most of the time we're feeling a lot more well, weather helm than we need to be. I mean, if the boat is in this too hot position and you're feeling a lot of weather helm, that's not, that's not a fast way to sail the boat. So we need to do other things to bring our heel back to this just right position so that we can reduce our helm to that kind of slight pull that we're speaking of now. Good. Any other thoughts or questions about usage of the rudder, either while sailing fast, uh, straight, or through tacks or jibes or rounding marks or anything like that? Good. Next one, main sheet. We've talked about this a little bit, but um, this is exactly what we mentioned a moment ago. Don't fight the rudder, ease the main. So you can see this person is sailing too hot. They're, the edge of their boat is dug into the water. Their board is not at an optimal angle. Their sail is in all the way, which is good for generating power. But as we can see, too much power has been generated and we have a lot of weather helm. This person has to apply a lot of pressure to the tiller um, to keep the boat from rounding up immediately into the wind. So, you know, while we often say you got to get that sail in, got to get that sail in, that's true um, until you're overpowered, in which case you should probably ease the main a bit to reduce the, the uh, forces on the boat so that you can get it back to its line, so to speak, which really just means that kind of optimal heel angle through the water. Um, I said here, it's the primary sail control. And, and when I say primary, I mean, it's, it's really the main sail control. You have your vane, you have your traveler and all these other things, but your main sheet, which of course changes the angle of, of the boom to the wind, uh, you know, is, is most of, is really what we should be focusing on as we're learning to sail the boat fast. I said, seek the ideal, go easy. Really what I mean by this is just, it's not a set it and forget it kind of control. It's not like you can simply say, when I'm going upwind in the MC, I crank in my main sheet to my mark on the line or, or eight or 10 inches between the blocks or whatever you like to use to measure. And then just assume that even in the current conditions, it, it's going to remain the same for that entire upwind leg. It's, it's, a, it's a thing of constant feedback and adjustment. Um, and sometimes, sometimes the difference between good and great is an inch an inch in, an inch out, maybe an inch or two out as, as a puff is hitting so that uh, until you stabilize the boat and then you can kind of tick it back in. A lot of times I'm, I'm moving my main sheet just one ratchet click at a time. Mm -hmm. smooth. Um, yeah, please Ryan. Yeah, I'll add to that. Yeah, you want to make those small adjustments. Um, and then also when you're like really overpowered, uh, don't be afraid to ease it a lot. Like Joe was talking in inches, but if you're really overpowered, you might have to be like easing like feet of main sheet. Um, and then once, once you're back and you have the correct boat heel, 
then you want to pull that main sheet back in uh, quickly. So it's a const constant adjustments out there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, um, it is small adjustments from time to time, but also, yeah, if you, I mean, we're all taught when we learn to sail that if you, if you're going to tip over, dump the main. And while in a race, you probably never want to entirely let go of your main sheet, as Ryan said, giving out you know, two or three or four feet, I mean, even to the edge of the boom is, you know, out over the corner of your boat is not something to be avoided necessarily. I mean, if you get hit with a lot more wind than you're expecting, it's not going to, to really hurt your speed too much. And in fact, it's probably better for your speed to just let it out so that your boat doesn't dig in and you end up rounding up into the wind, which really will slow you down quickly. It's much better to just ease the pressure and then pull it back in, you know, as quickly as you can to, to a point that um, where you're fast and not overpowered. Mm -hmm. This one, body placement. Um, I really like this slide. Uh, thank you. Ryan is the guy who always says, move like a cat on the boat. So I have this nice cat picture, which uh, he immediately commented on when I showed him the slides the other day. Um, but yeah, body placement is just so important uh, when sailing our MCs. They really don't weigh very much. They weigh like 400, 450 pounds, fully rigged. Um, so, you know, if you're 150 or 200 or whatever, how much you weigh, that's, you know, could be up to half the weight. Of, or half as much as, as uh, of the boats or a third of the weight of the, the object, you and the boat moving through the water. So your body placement really is quite impactful on the MC. Um, I like, I call it a free variable. The reason I call it a free variable is because the main sheet and the rudder have, are very, they have controlled movement. It's not exactly binary. They're certainly dynamic. You can move them quickly or, or slowly, large or small movements, but they're constrained in what they do. The tiller goes left and right. The, the main sheet goes in and out. Your body, on the other hand, is much more flexible. You can, um, I mean, you want to stay close to your traveler, so you are kind of like moving along that line, um, but there are many more, uh, I don't know, places where you can put your body to me than the main sheet or, or the tiller. So um, I kind of think of, it, think of it as my, like ace up my sleeve a little bit, like using my body correctly on the boat um, becomes very important in my mind for sailing fast. And we touched on this right. earlier, but um, it's very important to control the heel of the boat just in general, and you can use it uh, along with the principles of hull steering we spoke about earlier. Uh, your body placement can can be quite uh, powerful as you initiate um, tacks or jibes, or even just to you know to maintain straight line speed. I think Ryan, you're going to mention something. Oh, yep. Oh, uh, I was going to answer the question from the comment, set, comment section. So Jane asks, if overpowered constantly, would you lower the traveler or just play with the main sheet? And what I would say to uh, how to solve being overpowered constantly, I would say just leave the traveler in the middle and just play the main sheet. Um, so just don't be afraid to, you know, ease it out like feet until you're not overpowered and then you're flatter and then pull it back in uh, once you're flatter. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't be worried about constantly uh, adjusting the traveler. Um, that would definitely just uh, put more things um, 
that you'd have to pay attention to. Um, I just would like, keep it simple and keep, keep the traveler in the middle. And do you ever cleat the main? Um, uh, yes, I'd, I, so I do cleat the main uh, at times. <laughs> um, so, um, and that, oh, in situations where I cleat the main is, is in a unique situation um where it's like super windy and i probably need a crew but i don't have a crew um and then i will like cleat the main and then only like play the traveler which is reverse of what i just said so like that's like uh when I cleat the main and then only do the traveler, that is a unique uh, situation where it's very windy and um, I should have a crew, but I don't. Yeah, it's also a very advanced maneuver. I think yeah. I learned yeah, for, yeah. Yeah, definitely for like 95% of situations, just like keep the traveler in the middle and just, uh, ease and trim your main sheet and if yeah if you're like beginner intermediate uh definitely do it that way and it's a good rule of thumb to not cleat the main because then you can uh tip over uh, jamie here don't you think part of that is also in that stronger wind recognizing you know how steady it is um like, I feel like both the traveler's a little more, you know, the main sheet, you're constantly moving, so that's quick adjustments. So if it's gusty, puffy, play with the main sheet instead of the traveler, and don't clean it, right? I mean, that's 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 the sure way to tip, is puff gust hits you with a cleated main sheet. Um, but if you've got, I mean, there is steady heavy wind occasionally, but more likely, it's, so that's where I think about the traveler. Hey, I'm constantly overpowered. Put the traveler down a bit and then still play the main sheet. Whereas if I'm only occasionally overpowered, I don't really, you know, the traveler gets adjusted maybe three, four, I don't know. And I'm curious to hear other people's opinions, maybe three or four times on an upwind leg or maybe 10 times the traveler gets adjusted on an upwind leg in heavy wind, but the main sheet hundred a thousand times on an upwind leg yeah yeah i think i would echo really everything that everyone has said from my perspective um i think for beginner and intermediate for beginner people i i really think that don't even worry about the traveler for the most part if you're out in really heavy wind maybe you drop it down six inches and then don't touch it really focus on the main sheet as your primary control. Um, as more of an intermediate sailor who wants to explore optimal usage of the traveler, uh, I agree with you, Jamie. I think that I would touch the traveler, you know, no more than 10 times or so during an average heavy upwind leg. Um, still, I think for, for someone who doesn't have a strong kind of intuitive muscle memory associated with straight line fast sailing. So like adjusting their body and the main sheet and keeping the right amount of weather helm on the tiller. Um, unless those things are automatic for you. I mean, at least for me, I, they're not entirely automatic for me yet. They're getting there, but those are really my main points of focus and things like the traveler can just be very distracting. So if you're, if you want to use the traveler um, and you're still learning to automate those primary controls, my suggestion would be to, to a little bit set it and forget it. So, I mean, maybe not entirely, you might still want to adjust it sometimes if you're suddenly, you have it down six inches and you're just not generating enough power, then sure. Yeah. Bring it up or, um, you know, you're overpowered and you need to drop it down, definitely do that. But I would emphasize the usage of the primary controls while learning. 
Yep, I, I agree, Joe. Um, so John has another question. Uh, where should your body be placed? Uh, fore to aft um, for upwind. Sure, um, close to the traveler. I, I try to sit very kind of square, like square hips, square shoulders, square knees, try to keep my legs together a little bit and elbows in a little bit tight and have this kind of, and if anyone was on the call with uh, Bill Colburn a couple of weeks ago, he mentioned this a little bit too. He said, I mean, look at a YouTube video of what a professional sailor looks like, like a, even like a laser sailor or someone they're just very controlled and um, kind of compact in how they put their body on the boat. And I think we want to do the same thing in our MCs. You want to sit close to the traveler bar, um, square to the boat with your hands like this, tiller, main sheet, and then hike out straight out, um, straight out behind you. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then he also asked, downwind and reaching and I would say for downwind and reaching it's it's the same spot um you're always sitting right next to the the traveler bar uh the only time I would like maybe switch my position like forward to aft um is like say there's like some huge wave coming I might uh temporarily like lean my shoulders backwards um, and to move your weight back to help get the bow up over the wave. Um, but on Harriet, there, there are no waves. So that's only a technique that you might use at uh, Clear Lake in Iowa. May I add something, guys? This is Bill. Yep. Um, I would also add that your crew sits back at the traveler. So you kind of sail shoulder to shoulder and you work together and you keep your weight right there. That's the one thing I would have added. This is great guys. You, everything I'm, I'm, and Joe, I love your uh, focus on the angle of heel and then where your body is and your main sheet. Like that's, that's just right on and your steering. So it's nice to think about things so simply. Way to go. Thank you. Good. Ryan, were there any other comments in the, uh, or questions in the comments chat? Um, no, I think, I think that we're good. Good. Okay. So the final slide here, I said elements in practice. These are all the same things that we've been talking about. We, we maintain, or for me, I think about maintaining my heel as my primary source of feedback, primary metric. Um, when overpowered, we remember to use our main sheet more than our rudder. Uh, we try to neutralize the helm on our rudder, almost neutralized, not quite as Ryan mentioned. We want just a little bit of pull so that we know that we're sailing as close to the wind as we can when going upwind. Um, but if we're, we're heavy, heavily overloaded with power, much better to get in the practice of depowering using the main sheet to maintain that optimal heel angle instead of having to you know, pull down quite hard on the rudder to keep the boat from rounding up into the wind. Um, similarly, we should use our bodies um, really quite a lot when sailing the boat. You, you hike out hard to um, be able to keep the boat flat and keep it from rounding up so that you can keep the sail in tight and um, generate as much force as, as you can sustain in balance. Um, you might also use your body for other things. Like uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, you might use your body in, in coordination with the hull steering principles to begin or to initiate attack through the wind while going upwind. Um, when it's light wind, you might need to use your body all the way on the low side, because even in light wind, when there's not enough pressure from the wind to, to achieve that 15 to 20 degrees upwind sailing heel angle, 
you might need to kind of just force the boat to do that by moving your body weight over to the low side um, to bring to bring it up to that 15 to 20 degrees. So, um, so I like to say your body is the free variable. You can do, it's very dynamic and flexible. And I would encourage everyone to move frequently, uh, maybe not frequently, but um, to consider the placement of your body as an important part of maintaining heel angle and uh, maintaining optimal speed in the MC. The last thing I put on here is a kind of modified uh, common acronym that we all know. Many of us have heard the term ease hike trim. Uh, generally, that refers to when you're going upwind and you, you uh, start to feel a little bit overpowered, the order of operations, just like we've been talking about, you use your main sheet to depower um, and you use your main sheet to depower instead of the rudder because you don't want to let the boat go right up into the wind. You don't want to fight the rudder. And also, usually it happens too quickly for you to be able to hike hard with your body and um, prevent the negative outcomes such as the boat rounding up quickly into the wind. So, so to immediately depower, you can use the main sheet, ease the main sheet. Then you can adjust your body placement. That's what we mean by hiking. Perhaps you, you go out a little bit further, you engage those abs and, um, and hike hard. And then you can kind of ease the main sheet back in um, to, to begin to generate a little bit more power or recover some of the power that you lost through that um, easing process. But it is much better to, as Ryan mentioned earlier, it is much better to dump even a couple feet of main sheet to prevent the boat from getting tipped over too much or rounding up quickly into the wind. And that will be much faster, assuming you pull it in fairly quickly once you're under control than, um, than using the rudder or letting the boat go into the wind. Yeah. And the last thing I have here on this list is, is boat heel. So uh, to me, this is just a reminder that we our order of operations is ease, hike, trim. Um, and then we're immediately focused back on, am I at an optimal heel? Um, and then also, are we in a good, uh, are we sailing at a good angle to the wind? So maybe we've reacted to high pressure and it hits us quickly and we have to ease hike trim. But now that once we trim back in, um, perhaps the wind moved a little bit to one side or we're going a little bit faster. So we can actually potentially point one or two or three degrees higher than we were previously. Uh, so we do want to pay attention also to our uh, kind of angle, our heading. And Ryan, maybe I'll ask you to jump in and share what this acronym means to you as well. Okay. Yep. Yep. I I modified it and added the boat heel. So yeah, what I mean about that is, okay, so you're feeling overpowered. So step one is like ease out the main sheet. Um, step two would be, so you're gonna be feeling a lot of like weather helm. Uh, so step two is gonna be like, let the boat like round up and point into the wind a little bit more. You're gonna have a lot of speed and power. So you're gonna be able to point a little bit higher, especially on like Harriet where, um, where there are no waves. Um, pointing higher is, a lot, a uh, lot easier. Um, so, and then, but once you start pointing more and in, more into the wind, uh, then you're going to start to slow down, um, and your boat's going to start to flatten out once you're pointing more into the wind. Um, so, once your boat's more flattened, step three is going to be pull your main sheet back in, um, and then also. Step three, as you pull your main sheet back in, start like hiking harder than you were because you're going to want to use your body weight to turn the boat away from the wind because um, you just were pointing more into the wind to depower. 
So now once you start to slow down, you want to start to point more away from the wind and you can use your body and hike hard to kind of pull away from the wind and sail a lower angle. Um, so when I think about ease hike trim, I also think about how can I use uh, my boat heel through that process uh, to assist with uh, depowering. Can I just add one more thing, um, Joe? I think the, the, remembering the ease hike trim and then heel um, acronym is really important because if you're feeling overpowered um, because it's a puff that came up maybe unexpectedly or um, it's good to dump some of that wind right away rather than tip over because that will really slow you down if you have to hmm. um, bring your boat back up. So. It's, it's better to lose a little bit of speed when you dump some wind um, and then re recapture and, and get back into the race. Um, so thank you for that acronym. Yeah, that, I, I certainly agree with you. Uh, pointy end to the side or pointy end down, never fast. Okay, yeah, I think we can go to our next uh, presentation. Uh, Joe, should we take a, like a three minute break? Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, 90 minutes is too long to sit in one place and pay attention. So okay. I can three minute break, get some water, stretch out whatever you need. Did we lose Joe or what? Oh no, we're just taking a two, two more minute break and then Ryan is going to begin with his content about um, fast starts. Paul, you, you asked, will we be talking about boat speed on a downwind leg? Um, the presentation today really was focused on upwind speed and sailing. Uh, I didn't really touch on downwind, but I think that's a uh, potential topic for the future. So I appreciate your question. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that was a question that Jen and I kind of both had. So, all right. Yeah, Joe, when I'm presenting here, let me know if questions come through the chat. Yeah, sure. Thank you for jumping on that and doing that while I was speaking. I meant to ask, you, but um, you were on it. So I'll do the same for you. Happy to. Okay. All right. Was that three minutes? I think so. Okay. All right. So I'm Ryan. Um, and today, or for the second half, we're going to talk about starts. Um, and I'm going to talk about what to do before the start, what to do for the start, and what to do like right after the start. Um, and starts are going to be a big part of your race. Um, and it's going to allow you to basically 
if you get a good start, it's going to allow you to get a head start on uh, against everyone else. Um, and here is a picture of uh, some ice fishermen uh, ice fishing uh, while we're uh, college sailing here on, on Lake Minnetonka. Um, and luckily this year, uh, we have uh, already uh, all the ice is melted and we have the lake ready for us uh, to get started and racing out there. Um, and I'm gonna skip over this first part, um, but this is a checklist uh, for you. Basically the theme is um, just make sure that you are prepared uh, before the start um, start of the race and just make sure you um, have a checklist and that you make sure you have everything um, so you're not distracted um, when you're out there during the race. Um, okay, so I would recommend that uh, that you get out there um, at least like start get out there and start sailing around like an hour before the race. Um, I will admit, admit that I'm not always out there like an hour before the race sailing around. Um, but uh, the more time uh, you can give yourself uh, for sailing around before the race, um, the, the better that you will do. Um, and the reason is, is what I'm gonna talk about right now. Um, and so before the start of the race, you wanna be able to recognize the patterns in the wind. So when you get on that first windward leg, you know exactly what the wind's doing. Um, so this is what I will do like before the start of a race. Um, and I will sail upwind on one tack and um, say starboard tack right here. And um, can you see my mouse? Is this, or can you not see my mouse? Uh, we, I can, it's a little tiny, but I can see it. Okay, okay. Here, I'll just start drawing. So here I'll sail upwind on starboard tack. And so here is like a, a lifted tack because the angle is pointing more towards the marks than this other angle, so say, you might, the wind might shift and you might get knocked. And then you might sail like a, a little bit worse angle um, that's not pointing at the uh, windward marks up here as much. Um, and then if you might get lifted on the starboard tack before the race. So you're trying to remember what the good angles are and what the bad angles are um, when you're sailing upwind. Um, so if you remember these angles, then you can remember when you're on that first windward leg during the race, you can remember, okay, I'm on a good angle. I should keep going. Like this is a good angle. Or if you're on starboard tack during the race and you're on this angle, that means that you should tack because it's, it's a, not as good angle. Um, uh, so so and what you have to remember is um, the wind on Lake Harriet is going to oscillate like 95% of the time. Um, and so that what that means is the wind is going to oscillate like an oscillating fan. So it might be blowing down the middle at one point, then it'll go blow from this side for a little bit, then I'll go down to the middle, and then I'll go down, blow, start blowing from the left side for a little bit, then I'll go back to the middle, and then I'll go back to the right side. So that's what the wind will do like 95% of the time. 5% uh, of the time um, will be, it will not do that. And that happens when like there's a storm in the area um, and uh, then crazier things will happen with the wind. Um, but if there's no storm around, your wind is probably gonna oscillate in this back and forth pattern. 
Um, any any questions? So Ryan, I would oscillate so much. That means we are always tacking all the time to be on lift attack, or what do we do? So, so are you asking that? Do you always want to be on the lift attack? Yeah, because with so much oscillation, how do we handle that? I mean, if you're on attack and sometimes it's lifted, sometimes it's not lifted, right? So how do we handle so many weights, so much variation? Do we, do we just stay on the track for some time or what do we do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. as a good rule of thumb, you want to uh, stay on the lifted tack. And, and if you're not lifted, um, then, uh, then you, that means you want to tack. So I would say that's a good rule of thumb. Um, and okay, so my next next point. Uh, so I said sale point. Um, oh, and the second point, uh, second point right here. Um, so time 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 your starts before the start of the race. So you want to remember uh, the final time and final distance for your final approach. Um, before the start of the race, and I'm going to dive into that deeper on another slide, but this is just another thing that you can do, like before the start of the race. Um, if you, if you can practice your speed with another boat to sail alongside another boat, um, either like talk to them and say, hey, can we just sail up wind and compare speed on the same tack? Um, so you can do with that. Uh, do that right next to someone um, and you can ask them or or just start sailing right next to someone um, and just compare your speed. Um, they don't even have to know, <laughs> but you can also ask. Um, so uh, wind direction indicators. Um, so before the race, you want to just know like what kind of things out there can tell you where the wind's going to come from. Um, and that might be like flags on the shore or flags on the race committee boats. Uh, you want to know if there's like any anchored boats, like anchored race committee boats or like anchored boats in the buoy field that might tell you, uh, where the, the wind's coming from. So the anch the anchored boats will swing on the anchor and they will show you like a potential future, uh, wind direction that's coming um and then uh you want to know if there's like uh other sailboats around that uh might be out there sailing around like during the race um that uh, might tell you where the wind's uh coming from uh, and then you also want to be uh aware of any like potential uh geography um before the start of the race um, like, are there any like low points in the shore that uh, may, may give you more wind? And are there any like hills that may like block wind? Um, and in general, you want to like sail for the low spots and avoid the hills. Um, and then always know like before you actually start the race to uh, always know uh, where the buoys are um and uh some races um they can put them in kind of late and then but you want to know like where the where they are so you can uh sail the the better angles towards the buoys i think i saw a, a question in the comments joe is there a question That was me. I'm sorry. It's actually, more of a statement from Jamie, I think. Yeah. Okay. No question. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so at around five minutes, I like to ask myself where the favorite end is. Um, and the way I determine the favorite end is I just try to think about okay, what side of the line is going to cross. Um, 
if I start on one side of the line, am I going to cross a boat that is starting on the other side of the line? So if you think of this here as your start line, um, if you're to start on the right side of the line, you got to think about, okay, if a boat starts on the left side of the line, who might cross in front? Um, and so this is going to answer the question, like, what side of the line should I start on? Um, and you want to have that answered, like, before the race starts. Um, and so one way that can influence uh, influence uh, your decision is if, like, one side of the line is, like, higher up, like here, like the right side of the line is a little bit higher up. So that might mean that uh, the boats on the right side of the line here might cross in front of the boats on the left side of the line. Um, and then also um, in this below drawing here, say like, oh, your line is pretty square this way, but uh, maybe one angle, like the starboard angle here um, is pointing a lot more towards towards the mark than than the port angle. So then here too, the the starboard end of the line um, would be favored because the starboard boat would cross in front of the port boat. So you can actually, if you have uh, a friend out there, you can actually just have both boats sail off both ends of the line and see who crosses in front. Uh, that's that's something you can do. A lot of times, I'll just I can just kind of like visualize it um, by just sailing off one end, end of the line. Um, but you definitely want to know uh, what uh, what side of the line if the if those boats uh, will cross in front of the other boats on the other side of the line. Um, so you know that oh I should start more towards that end because it's the favorite end. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, okay, so in the zero to five minute range, you gotta start asking yourself, uh, when do I crawl? So I have this term crawl, because I don't like saying stop on the starting line. A lot of times people talk about stopping on the starting line, but I actually never try to stop on the starting line. Um, and what I'll do is, I'll basically stop, essentially stop, but I'll always try to be moving as slowly forward as possible. So it might look like I'm stopped, but I'm always trying to just move slowly forward. Um, because once you're completely stopped, then you're gonna lose your steering ability and you might start to like go backwards and then you're gonna get yourself into trouble that way. So always try to like, uh, always try to crawl, which is basically like stopped, but moving um, as slow as you can forwards. Um, and then I have here is basically a rough guide at when you want to start uh, sprinting towards the line, um, which is basically like you're. Uh, when you're going full speed um, at the start. Um, and these are just some numbers that are a rough guide. Basically, if there's more wind, you're going to start going at full speed, maybe like with less than eight seconds. Um, and if there's only like five miles an hour of wind, you may want to be going at full speed at like 20 to 40 seconds. Um, these are really rough numbers. Um, so you're going to want to actually uh, test this out before the start of the race. 
and know, okay, how long does it take me to get up to full speed? Like, is it eight seconds or is it like 20 seconds? Um, and you can actually test that before the start of the race. Oh. And you test it by just practicing it a couple of times. Yeah, I think and on your first slide, you have a point about time and distance um, in that five to 60 minutes before the race. And to me, that's the prep for, for what you're talking about right here. That practicing that uh, crawling up to the line and how long does it take me to get up to full speed and how far back from the line do I need to be? Um, that can, to me, that can be very uh, um, ambiguous and intimidating when first starting. But I think by just mocking it up, as you suggest, before the sequence starts, we can have a good sense for their, in these conditions, time and distance, how far away do I need to be and when should I pull in my sail? Any, any questions? Um, so next question is like, where, where do I crawl? Um, and so I think this is a really important point, um, uh, cause I see this mistake a lot, um, with both beginners and advanced people. Um, so like where you start your uh, final approach to the starting line uh, is influenced a lot or should be influenced a lot by the actual wind direction. So if the wind direction is coming from the right side um, and it's blowing this way, like to be able to point your boat into the wind to stop on the starting line, you're going to have to be pointing like this. Um, and so you're going to need more space between you and the line to be able to point like that into the wind. And, um, and then uh, a lot of times I'll see people, if the wind's coming from the right side, they'll be pointed like this. And they'll try to stop like this. But uh, the wind's coming from here. And because they're not pointed into the wind, they won't be able to stop their boat and they won't understand why they won't be able to stop. And then they'll just keep like sailing across the line and then they'll be like over the starting line. Um, so I think if, if the wind is coming from the right side, definitely give yourself more space uh, between you and the line. And then if it is, the wind is coming down the middle, um, then you need a little bit less space. And then if the wind is coming from the left side, you want to be a lot closer to the starting line um, when you start your final approach and start accelerating uh, because it's going to be a lot harder to cross the line. It's going to take you like longer to cross the line. Um, and um, so this is something to think about um, where where you are um, before the start. Does that, anyone have any questions? For, for this, this reason, when the wind uh, comes from the right side here, like uh, you'll get a lot of general recalls and you'll have to do a lot of restarts um, because people, will just like sail right across the line because they won't be able to stop their boat because they won't be pointed into the wind and because they'll be set up like too close to the line. Um, so if you're getting a lot of general recalls, like the wind is probably coming from the right side. Is there sort of a tactics question on that left side where you want to get onto port tack? Oh. Um, yeah, so something to think about, yeah, when the wind is coming from the left side, um, 
definitely you're probably going to want to start on the left side of the line and you're probably going to want to try to start your race where you have the ability to tack the port as quickly as you can um that's something you have to think about because there's also going to be a lot of like starboard boats over here that might prevent you from tacking um so um i when the wind's like this i always try to like not have a a boat that a starboard boat like right next to me that might prevent me from tacking as soon as i can um that doesn't always i can't always prevent a a starboard boat from being right there but uh i try to get like a hole almost a hole to windward of me so i can tack as soon as i can onto port does that answer your question yeah absolutely thank you okay so how to crawl um so this is similar to what i was talking before um so you want a uh, personal bubble so this is just a normal start uh, wind is coming straight down you want to have a personal bubble around your boat and create some have some space if, if possible um definitely this is like the worst spot to have someone right by you is if someone is right to leeward of you um because then what's gonna happen if they're in this green area what's gonna happen is they're gonna be sailing right next to you and uh you're gonna get started in the race and then uh, they're going to sail right past you because you're going to be in their wind shadow. And I'll show you. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, so the wind shadow comes off of both the, the windward side of the boat and leeward side of the boat. So here, the wind shadow is right here, too. So if your boat is right next to them uh then you're going to be getting bad air and they're just going to sail right past you um so the most important spot to have space on the starting line is this lured spot um and then you also want a little bit of space uh to one word of you, but it's not as important as as important as the lured space. Um, and we, when you're actually trying to crawl, um, removing your vang tension is really important because the vang is like a second main sheet. And if you have your vang pulled on, it's going to be pulling in your sail. Um, Okay. Any any questions? Um, oh, one one thing I like to do. Um, so once I have my boat pointed into the wind, so initially when I'll try to stop, I'll let out my sail, um, and point my boat into the wind. And once I know my boat is pointed into the wind you can actually like be crawling slowly forward and almost stopped and you can actually pull in your main sheet a lot so when you do start accelerating you don't have to pull in as much main sheet um and then if your boat is actually pointed very close into the wind you can actually pull in your main sheet and you won't start uh accelerating uh, because your boat's pointed very close into the wind. Um, and so that's something I like to do. So when I get started, I don't have to pull in as much 
uh, main sheet. Ryan, I have a question. This is Bill. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do if someone comes into your personal bubble, especially for to yeah. Lourdes? Yeah, that's 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 a great question. Uh, so, yeah, so this is this is me right here, and when I'm right here, I'm always like looking backwards on the start line because there are these people they call them like sharks and they'll try to sail into your like lured hole here and you want to be looking backwards and like look out to the sharks and they can come from either side they can come from that side too um and so to defend against that like one thing you can do is like let out your sail all the way, um, take up more space. Um, and then you can also like point your boat down. Um, but then you have to be like aware of like the leeward uh, rules because they might be right here and then they just might like head you back up because um, they are the lead, because X is the leeward boat over Y. Um, so pointing down doesn't always work. Um, so one thing I'll do a lot of times is just sail and I'll like, if I see someone coming who might take my hull, hull I'll just kind of uh, collapse my hole a little bit. So I'll make the hole a lot smaller, but, uh, but I'll still maintain a little space. And if you make your hole, a lot smaller, then that's going to discourage the sharks from taking your hole because it just won't look as appetizing. And then they'll go uh, try to get into uh, a much bigger hole. Um, and so still, like, it may see, seem counterintuitive to actually make your hole smaller. Um, but that's actually a lot better than like, there'll be people who will like just come right below you and they'll only leave like maybe like two inches between you and them. And then you're like, you're in a really bad position if you're like boat X and they're Y and they leave like two inches. Um, then you're in a really bad position and you're not going to have a good start. Uh, so I like, always like to control my own destiny and uh, I will like self-destruct my hole a little bit, but still leave like more than two inches. And that's still a better hole than if someone were to like uh, come sail right by me and only leave two inches. Does that make sense? Thank you, Ryan. That was awesome. Collapse, collapse, collapse the bubble. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of times after you, this is where like boat handling comes in, after you collapse your hull and then they do sail by, if you have good boat handling, then you can start to like, say you collapse the hull, they sail right by and then no one else is going to take your hull. You can start to like really really like pinch and really try to hold your boat in one spot and then hopefully this lured boat here is not good at boat handling hopefully they like drift down the line more and then the hole opens back up um so um that can happen too all right um this, hey Ryan, one more question yep. uh, from John Getzinger. He says, often there is one spot on the line, which is the most favored place to be. So all the boats want to be there as the horn blows. How, uh, there can be quite a crowd there. How do you maneuver to get there? Yep. And I would say, I don't always try to be like in the best possible uh position on the line like if it's if the line is really 
starboard favored. I don't always try to be this, uh, like say this is this is the starboard favored line right here. I don't always try to be right at the starboard side um, as it's really competitive over there. So if, if the line is starboard favored, then I will try to start on the right half of the line or the right third of the line. Um, and uh, so I just try to stay near the line and then uh, that gives me more options of where I can start and I don't have to compete for the best spot on the line. I'll also say that um, this decision where you start on the line um, is gonna be a lot more important if it's a really big line and a really big, and then you have a lot of competitors, um, where you start on the line is gonna matter a lot more. So if you're sailing at Clear Lake, Iowa, with 70 competitors, um, then where you start in the starting line is gonna matter a lot more. Um, and if you're on Lake Harriet, um, the favorite end uh, in a small fleet um, on a weekend race is not gonna matter as, as much. Um, so definitely like try to start in general, I'd say start, try to start uh, near the favorite end, um, but you don't have to be like the winner of the line every time. Um, and here, let's talk about uh, body weight um, steering. So I'm always thinking about like when I'm crawling, so um, crawling again is stopped, but moving as slowly as possible forward. Um, I try to think about where my body is in the boat. So if I'm really trying to like stop hard while I'm slowly moving forward, I'll put my body more towards the low side on the boat. And that's going to help drive the boat into the wind and they'll help me like stay stopped on the starting line. Um, and then when I do start to want to start accelerating, um, and if you need a, if you're like really pointed into the wind, uh, one thing you can do um, to pull your boat away from the wind is like be on the high side and that'll help turn your boat away from the wind um, so you can start ac accelerating. Um, so that's uh, how you can think about using your body um, while, while stopped on the starting line. Um, and so this is your like your final final approach. And I talked about like your final time and your final distance. So you want to practice this before the start of the race. So you know exactly, say like if it's 10 miles an hour of wind, um, then you'll probably need to get going at around eight seconds. Um, and you might need like one or two boat lengths to, uh, for your final, uh, final distance here. Um, but these things are going to change based on the wind conditions. Um, so you want to practice accelerating uh, so you know how much time you need to accelerate and how much distance you need to ac accelerate. Um, I also try to um, know, I try to like gauge how far away from the line I am um, by I try to look under my boom um, at the buoy and at the flag, like while I'm stopped at the starting line um, to try to gauge my distance um, from the line. And I try to do that pretty early because if you do that uh, and then if it's very close to the start, then there's gonna be some boats that are blocking your view. So I try to like, um, try to get set up and crawling on the line 
at around one minute is a good rule of thumb, but that's also going to change on the conditions. Um, and then for my final approach, um, I'll turn away from the wind and then I'll start sailing close hauled at full speed. Um, and I'll try to, knowing my final time and distance, I'll get started exactly at that time, should be like eight seconds in normal conditions and then be the perfect distance away, which would be like maybe like one or two boat lengths and then just get going uh, for the start. Um, and then after the start, uh, just you're gonna wanna avoid wind shadows um, like you see here. So try to stay out of other people's bad air that's coming off their sails and try to maintain your lane of clean air right here is the ideal. All right, any, any questions? Okay, I think that concludes my uh, presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ryan and uh, Joe. Um, you've given us a lot to think about as we get ready for the season. Um, if we have any more questions, we can entertain those questions. But otherwise, I look forward to seeing you down on Wednesday nights in May. We're, we're, Twin City Sailing Club is launching their fleet on May 8th. So we'll start the uh, following Wednesday um, to have fun to sail fast practices on the water and get us into the mood for doing uh, Wednesday nights racing in June, July, and August. So uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Joe and um, Ryan. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> Ryan, I just had one question for you about crawling up on the line. Um, yeah. You kind of showed that like your boat is pointing directly into the wind, but doesn't that make it impossible to get any power? Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a range of pointing into the wind. So if you think about your boat pointing into the wind, um, like if you po point completely into the wind, then yeah, you might completely stop and start going backwards. Uh, and you don't want that, but it's more of a range of like, the more you point your boat into the wind, like the harder you will stop. Um, so you kind of want to like, think about that. And if you need to stop harder, you're going to point more into the wind. And if you don't need to stop as hard, you're going to point like less into the wind. So it's kind of like how hard you slam on the brakes. Um, if you really need a slam on the brakes, you'll like point directly into the wind. And if you don't need to, then you won't point into the wind as much. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I've, I've just found it. You don't want to be pointing right in the wind at the point where you're losing steerage, right? Yeah, well, it depends how much speed you have. So uh, if you really need to stop fast, you might point directly into the wind for a little bit. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm.